Shabbos is always the big one. Everyone loves Shabbos. What, what, what's not to like about Everyone Shabbos? Everyone loves Shabbos. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's the easiest pitch for Judaism. Shabbos is always the best pitch for Judaism. Welcome back to another episode of Inspiration for the Nation. And this might be the biggest podcast episode that I've ever done. It took me more than two years to get this episode out there. I'm with the superstar, Benjamin. I don't know his full or real name, but Ben Shapiro. <sighs> Feels good to say that. So Ben Shapiro is a very famous Orthodox Jew, maybe the most famous Orthodox Jew in America, uh, maybe even the world. And he's known as that polit political commentator who's always wearing yarmulke, very opinionated, has very thought out views. And whether you love him or hate him, he's great at what he does. And I got the opportunity to sit down with him and discuss his life, his goals, his his ideas with him, uh, his favorite mitzvah, things that typically you don't really hear him talking about. You know, you hear a lot of the uh, political feedback and ideas, but this one's a, a bit different. And I don't know, it's, I, you know, you meet any yeshiva guy, they're always like, Ben Shapiro this, Ben Shapiro that. So here you go, yeshiva guy talking to him. So um, it was, it was the, opportunity of a lifetime and and I am so thankful that this was able to happen and uh, this episode is in memory of Shimon David ben Yaakov Shlema as well as Miriam Sarah bas Yaakov Moshe and if you're watching this for your first time on Living the Chaim please subscribe we're at 80,000 subscribers now and we're trying to get to 100k we're so close really we got to 80k in less than a year and we'd love for you to join the family it's free and you could Watch and see other podcasts here. Kosher Money, That's an Issue, Not Your Typical Podcast for Charlene, and so many more coming your way. Uh, Spirit of the Song, almost forgot about that one. And um, stick around for the end of this episode because I share some of my thoughts about Ben Shapiro and our conversation. Without further ado, Ben Shapiro. We can all use some inspiration to help us overcome the obstacles we encounter in our lives. Get ready for thrilling conversations about struggle and triumph with those in pursuit of making a positive impact in this world. I'm Yaakov Langer, and you're listening to Inspiration for the Nation. Okay, I um, thank you, Ben, for taking your precious time to spend some time with us. And I'm not even the right person to interview you. My wife has been a massive fan for you all these years, so um, she's not here, but I'm, I'm not bad. No, I appreciate it, thank um, you. She, she actually uh, once went to one of your events like a week after she had knee surgery, and she asked you a question, and then she, I don't know why, but she asked you for a selfie, big no-no, and you actually ran up to take a selfie with her. I don't know if you remember Okay, I'm glad that. I was a nice person. That's, that's good. Yeah, you're a mensch. That's what counts. So I want to talk to you about like your background, meaning I, I'm under the impression that you aren't, weren't religious your whole life, and I want to get to know you better and see you know, when that transition happened in your life. So my, my entire family became Orthodox when I was 11. So basically we had always kept a certain level of kosher in the house, but not kosher out. Uh, and then when I was little, uh, I'd say like four or five years old, we were going down to the Venice community. So we were driving down there on, on Shabbat. That was an Orthodox synagogue. Uh, so from the time I was very little, we were always associated with Orthodoxy. We never went to a Reform or Conservative synagogue. If we did go to synagogue, uh, it was an Orthodox synagogue. Uh, and then I ended up going to an Orthodox day school when I was probably eight or nine years old for fifth and sixth grades. And I'd come home to my parents and I would say, like, why are we not doing X, Y, and Z? And my parents would say, well, we probably should be. And so we finally moved into an Orthodox community full time when I was 11 years old. Um, but, you know, before that, I would say that, you know, we would eat hash browns at McDonald's or stop at KFC. So it was, it was mostly stuff like that. Um, but, you know, I, I would say that most of my life, whatever we were doing Jewishly, we were doing in a, a sort of modern Orthodox fashion. Do you ever look back and be like, whether it's McDonald's or I don't know, whatever activities you guys are doing, and like, oh man, I should have really kept, you know, like, you know, done a little more of that? Uh, not really. Uh, I mean, the, the truth is that especially after you visit Israel and you go to a kosher McDonald's, and you're like, this is not nearly as good as I remember this being when I was six. Uh, that that that's right. definitely uh, it. Kind of wakes you up. You're like, wow, KFC, that'll be amazing. And then you go and you're like, no, this is this is actually not that that great as it turns out. Like the fries are pretty good, but aside from that. Like the, the, the mashed potatoes at KFC are okay, but, but 
Yeah, everything tastes better when you're when you're six or seven years old. So then you become an adult. You're like, oh, actually, this meat is made of of like cardboard, and it's kind of not wonderful. So don't mean to rip on fast food chains here, but yeah, yeah, it's all good. I, I don't know if they're actually going to be watching this, but you never know. Um, so now that you're an Orthodox person and you're living a Torah driven life, and we live in such a chaotic world. I mean, you're immersed in the world and the politics and everything going on. How do you kind of balance those two ideas? Well, I mean, there's sort of two questions there. One is on a personal level, how I balance my, my orthodoxy with my job. Uh, and then the other is sort of ideological and values driven. Uh, and the, the first is pretty easy. I mean, I live in an orthodox community. My family is orthodox. My parents are orthodox. You know, I've sat next to my dad in shul literally every Shabbos since we were going to shul. So since I was, you know, eight or nine years old. Uh, and and so the the idea of living in an integrated community, an integrated Orthodox community where, where, you know, everybody is sort of living that lifestyle, it makes it very easy. And we're lucky. We live in a great community here in South Florida. So that, that, that's really, really nice. Uh, and then when I go to work, I mean, I, I wear a yarmulke and I do my job and I try to treat people, you know, as they, as they should be treated. And then when it comes to sort of the more interesting values question, uh, what, what I've always said is that Judaism believes in certain fundamental values that don't necessarily require complete belief in every aspect of Torah in order to accept them because they undergird a lot of major world religions. They undergird a lot of Western civilization. I write about this a lot in Right Side of History. I think they start at Sinai, but I don't think that, that it's necessary for you to be an Orthodox Jew to believe these things, things like the, the rules-based universe created by God, the, the notion that, that God made man in his image, uh, the belief that the things that you do in life actually have some inherent value and that there are rules to, to life that are going to allow you to live a better and more fulfilled life, that there are roles in life that allow you to live a better and more fulfilled life. And all that stuff is inherent in Judaism, and that carries forward without having to refer back to the Torah specifically for its justification, but it happens to be that that is really how the tradition has been brought down, and those values undergird a lot of my politics. So you, on, on the show, you don't hear me quoting the Bible very much, but a lot of the values that I talk about are biblically driven. Wow, that's that's incredible. Yeah, definitely as a yeshiva guy listening to you, um, I definitely hear a lot of those those ideas and concepts. What what's a concept in the Torah that that you wish the world adopted more? Um, I I think that the the fundamental basis of the Torah is that the actions that you have in life are things that God cares about, and so every element of what you do carries with it a certain level of duty and responsibility. And I think that we we kind of live in a society where the opposite is held to be true. That that nobody, including God, cares what you do with your own life. Why would God care about? who I marry or how I eat or how I dress or what I how I deal with other people. And the Torah is very much opposed to this. The idea is that inherent in the universe are values that God has put into has put into play. And so what you do matters an awful lot, not just to you, but also on a sort of more spiritual universal level. And I think that if, if people took that responsibility a little bit more seriously, then they would think through their actions a little bit more. A world where you think that your actions are basically you know, in the, the, it's a cold universe indifference to your actions is a world where you can get away with an awful lot of things because after all, who, who's there to stop you? Why do you think that in like 2022, that idea of nothing really matters has been so perpetuated more than any time in history? Because it comes with a lot of, uh, a lot of fun, right? I mean, the, the idea that nothing really matters liberates you to do all these things that society has always told you matter very deeply. I mean, the, the, the most obvious example, obviously, is when it comes to sex. And the, the simple fact is that traditional religion suggested that the most powerful drive that human beings have, the sex drive, ought to be channeled in productive ways toward monogamous marriage and the creation of children. And the way you're going to have a f- fulfilling sex life is you're going to marry somebody and then you're going to have sex with that person and you're going to create a family and children and you're going to create a deeper spiritual and emotional relationship with the person with whom you have sex. And then the the birth control pill makes it possible for, for sex and childbearing to be completely separated from one another. And now you have the possibility of a, of a wide variety of sexual experiences that are supposed to make you happier and, and more hedonistically joyful. Uh, and if you do that, then, you know, why not? It's gonna make, it's gonna make you a more fulfilled human being. Polymorphous perversity, as, as suggested by Freud, was, was going to be the order of the day. And for a lot of people, I mean, that's, that's, pretty, that's, that's a pretty good pitch. I mean, the pitch that you basically get to do whatever gives you sexual pleasure is a very strong pitch, especially without consequence. And so it, it's, it's sort of self-serving, but if you believe that, that, the, none of this stuff matters and shouldn't matter to anybody, then it allows you to do whatever you want. Doing whatever you want sounds like a, a pretty good lifestyle until you do it for long enough that you realize it's pretty empty. Yeah, that's actually on point. You know, you started saying sex, and I wasn't sure which direction you'd go, uh, like relationship type of sex or more like the pronoun game. And I, I didn't... Well, they're tied I, in with I apologize. one another. It, they're tied in with one another. Because again, once you have, have 
rested your identity on this idea that you're sort of a free-floating spirit separate from your body and that the only thing that matters is your own subjective sense of, of identity. Right? How you define yourself is how the world should define you. All that matters is how I view the world and what I do. It's completely narcissistic, but it also means that you're at odds with basic notions of, of shared truth because shared truth requires there to be an acknowledgement of another person that you're talking to. So when you say a thing like a male and the, and I'm supposed to know what you're talking about, you're supposed to know what you're talking about, there has to be a shared thing outside of us namely the definition of the word male that we both understand. But that cuts against the subjective self-understanding and self-definition that I want to have, which of course should never be subjected to some sort of meaning outside of me because that means there are rules that I have to abide by. Rules are bad. Rules inhibit you. Rules mean you're not totally free. And so th these things are very much tied together. I, I, when people ask me about like my tzitzes or tefillin or things that I'm like, I don't really fully know the best way to explain it. I always try to explain it like, like I'm in a car and I want to wear a seatbelt. It's limiting me, but at the same time, it's protecting me. You know, God forbid, I don't want to need to use it, but that's how I kind of look at like commandments and rules and yeah, and particularly, you the, share the, that idea. particularly the sort of ritualistic commandments of Judaism. There are certain behavioral commandments of Judaism, which are, are pretty easy to understand because they go to limitations on human nature and what's the best life and all of that. But when you're talking about tzitzes or lulav or, or, or tefillin or, or th things that we do where you look at it, you go, that's weird. And you're wearing a bunch of fringes on your car. That's a weird thing to do. You're you're, put, you're wrapping some leather straps around your arm every morning. I'm always and, when I'm shaking lulav. I'm always like, if people are looking at me, they think I'm crazy. Right. But, uh, of course. Them, I mean, and, and, and why, want, why you know? wouldn't they? I mean, you're literally just shaking right. a branch around. And you're holding like a lemon <laughs> in your hand. It's it's very it's it's right. weird, right? I mean, but the the idea right. there, I think, is to concretize the the spiritual. So the idea is again that everything in life is infused with meaning. And so what Judaism and religion in general seeks to do is take the physical world and create meaning around that physical world so that what you do matters. And so what, what separates this particular fruit from just being something that you eat is the willingness to place spiritual value in that thing. And the same thing is true with, with something like tzitzis, where again, the, the, the you know, spiritual justification in the Bible is that you're supposed to be able to look at it and this is gonna remind you of all the commandments. It's, it's sort of, you know, just a, and an app on your phone that, that reminds you to, to work out today, except it's to do commandments. And that's not a terrible idea. And so, so the idea of coming up with rationales for all of this, number one, as Rambam says, you don't have to have rationales for all this stuff. It's good to have rationales. That's nice. But just because you don't understand the rationale for something doesn't mean that you should get rid of it, uh, which is, I think, one of the big problems with the sort of rationalistic side of the Enlightenment that, that we've embraced full scale. Um, but, you know, the bringing down of traditions that we don't necessarily understand, but, but that have historically proved themselves to be a unifying factor in life, th these are a good thing. So, you know, you mentioned before when you were saying male, female and tapping into it, I, I always think of that like there's obviously a lot of viral moments that you've had. And I'm thinking of that like Boy Scouts. It's in the name. How often do people bring these ideas up? And are you getting like these clips, these, you know, uh, you know, the facts and feel don't care about your feelings? Like, are you jaded by all of these type of viral moments? But everything becomes a meme at a certain point. So when it first <laughs> when it first happens, then it's just sort of funny and interesting and it's cool that a lot of people are watching it. And then eventually everything gets boiled down into a meme. And so, you know, there, there are the pro memes and there are a lot of anti memes and and that, that's just the that's just the way that the world works. Everything eventually start. It starts off as like a full, actual ten minute explanation of what I'm talking about, which is what that clip started off as. And then it gets boiled down into that 15 second exchange, and that gets boiled down into uh, a two picture graphic, and then that gets boiled down into like a one word thing. And that that just happens over and over. And that's that's just the nature of the beast, I think. I'm curious if this interview is going to be boiled down into like that one slide meme. Um, so we were talking about the Torah before, and the Torah is, is huge. It's very vast, and there's so much to learn, so much to study. Is there one particular um, subject that you like studying, or maybe I, I know you've mentioned the Dafyomi before. Uh, what's your faith? So uh, the truth about Dafyomi is that I feel like it moves so fast that it kind of goes right over my head a lot of the time. Like I'm, I'm, I'm studying it and I, I get it, but, but I mean, that's not really the way you're supposed to study Gemara, really. I mean, the way you're supposed to study Gemara. You got to join Kini Namasechta. Yeah, exactly. It, 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 so you know, it's, it's, it's you know. a lot slower, but it's review and review. Yeah, yeah I mean, sorry the, the, for cutting you so off I, so I've started with, with my Chavrusa going through uh, Surba uh, Mirbanan. Uh, so I started going through like, uh, that's, a, that's kind of a source book where it goes through halacha, but it starts with like a pasuk from the Chumash and then it moves on to the Mishnah and then it moves through the Gemara and then it'll move on to the Shulchan Aruch and basically takes a piece of halacha and traces it from the beginning all the way till, you know, what the, what the sort of machlokas is today. Um, and so uh, th that I enjoy. I, I like going back and seeing sort of the original evolution of the law from what it says in the Torah to kind of how we practice it today. That, that stuff I find really, really interesting. Uh, obviously, I, I think that the, the stuff that I enjoy the most is just, Straight Chumash. I mean, it's it's there. There's just so much there. 
Uh, and uh, I will say that, you know, G- Gamora, it really depends on the Masechta. Uh, it, 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 <laughs> as, as somebody who tries to organize writing, uh, I have to say that one, one of the things that, that is very difficult, and listen, everybody who studies Gemara knows this, one of the things that's very difficult is it's such a, it's such a mashup. It's, it's it, you know, trying to follow the through line of Gemara is like trying to untangle my wife's necklace after she travels with it. It's, it's just like, I don't know where you're going. I don't know how we ended up here. Suddenly we're talking about, you know, rooster tracks and in brachos, and I have no idea what what this has to do with anything, but okay, I'm going along with it. Uh, so, you know, that, that that requires, you know, people who, who study a lot harder than I do to, to really suss it out. But the, the sort of, Straight through line halacha is the stuff that I enjoy. So it's funny you mentioned Gemara because I, I, I kind of look back to see what's going on. And you see these, you know, ancient people talking and, and rabbis and they're like fighting till death. But at the same time, you know, you hear stories about them getting along. Um, are there any of those ideas that you think we could take from them of this world? It's it's very polarizing. We're all fighting, unfortunately. But Maybe there's some common ground where, like, hey, maybe we're all trying to, to get to the same place. I mean, I, I think that that's a very warm gloss on the Gemara. I mean, the, 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 <laughs> I mean frankly, <laughs> if, you, if you read a my lot— Rebbe's, My Rebbe's going to be watching. I, I need yeah, to make no, sure I, mean, I sound the, good. The, the yeah. reason I say that is just because if you actually—I mean, everything between, you know, Rabban Gamliel and Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Mayer, and you, you have all of these arguments that are, that are knock down, drag out battles where people are being deprived of, of leadership positions and people are— are dying without having been visited by the other Rabban. Like the, the the notion that that things were much warmer then as opposed to now. Everybody personally knew each other because it was a pretty small circle of people. But at the same time, I mean, these are real knockdown, drag out battles in which people are being dramatically humiliated in front of one another, right? in, in which people are being de- deprived of leadership positions and then replaced back in leadership positions based on how they're treating other people, in which there's widespread resentment over you know, whether Rabban Gamaliel is dealing too much with the Romans or whether he's not dealing enough with the Romans and all this kind of stuff. It's, it's a good reminder that politics was always present. And so this sort of you know, glowing, you know, golden sort of vision of the past that we have where everybody got along, I mean— Right now, we're in the middle of of the Omer, which is, you know, a, a pretty good example of, of when a lot of people weren't getting along particularly well. Um, and, you know, the, the or if you go back to the three weeks, obviously, uh, then you're, you're talking about times throughout Jewish history where people were not getting along. So the, so the Jews not getting along has been a, uh, a theme in, in Jewish history throughout. But the nice thing about the Gemara is, is less to me sort of the interrelationship of the people in the Gemara arguing with one another, some of which is warm and some of which is pretty harsh. Um, and, and more the idea that there is a through line that starts from the Torah, moves through the Mishnah, moves through the Gemara, and then eventually, you know, ends up evolving itself through a system of common law uh, that, that's part of the chain of transmission today. So you've, you know, being that you have a Baal Shuva background, um, I've always found that Baal Shuvas often sometimes struggle with, you know, either adapting or, um, you know, certain ideas. Uh, but at the same time, you're a very bright fellow. You skip two grades, and I could say you're a genius. Do you still have trouble just getting into, just fitting in, I guess, or halacha, or just taking it all upon you? I mean, not not really, because I'm, I'm able to deal pretty easily with cognitive dissonance. I was having this conversation over Shabbos with somebody. So I was, I was talking about a halacha with regard to, for example, second day Yom Tov. So the halacha with regard to second day Yom Tov abroad, it— it does not make sense. Okay, second day Yom Tov just on a, on a pure Sephardic level does not make any sense. Like the, if, if, you, if you're going to make the argument that it's the Tekanas Chachamim and now we all have to keep it, okay, understood. I do second day Yom Tov, right? We all do. But, but mm-hmm. if you're just talking about like the reason it was originally implemented, which was people weren't sure about the date abroad because it took a while to light fires on the tops of mountains or to do a flag system. Right. Like now we have a set calendar. We've had a set calendar for several hundred years at this point. Everybody exactly knows when the holidays are. So there's no Sephardic level to keep second day Yom Tov. Um, there are spiritual reasons that you could probably bring that sort of to backfill the fact that there's no Sfarah, but this Sfarah on second day Yom Tov is extraordinarily weak, as everybody you know understands at this point, uh, which is why you know it comes up a lot. Yeah, that that sort of stuff doesn't particularly bother me though, because you have to either accept the system as a system or you don't accept the system as a system. And one of the big dangers is the idea that I don't you know understand why we're doing X, therefore I'm just not going to do X. And not only am I not going to do X, I'm now going to challenge the entire system of halacha that brought about us doing X. That's a real problem. And that's a problem because, again, just because I don't understand something fully or just because I disagree with something doesn't mean that I have an alternative system to provide that has allowed for the flourishing of millions of human beings over the course of thousands of years. And so, you know, I, I, I greatly fear the idea that my own rationalism is supposed to overcome the, the historic weight 
of halachic decisions that have been made over time. Now, do I wish that there would be a reconvene, uh, reconvene Sanhedrin that would overrule Second Day Yom Tov? 100%. Like, I, I, I wish that that would happen. Um, yeah, do, do, I, do I wish that there are a, a series of other things that would get solved? Of course, but the halachists agree with this, right? I mean, like, if there were a Sanhedrin today, presumably there'd be some attempt to do something about the Aguna crisis, right? I mean, like, th- these are ongoing halachic issues that have been going on for literally, at this point, thousands of years. Uh, and, the, and the fact that you have to accept the difficulties along with the benefits that's just an aspect of being a human being and understanding that people have to live within systems. So, you know, you're, you're if I put a dictionary out and I w- wrote the word logic, I would put like a picture of your face there. I don't know if your face is copyrighted, so I, I don't want to get in trouble. But basically, you're you're a very logical being. And do you do you on the other side, the emotional side, I don't know, somewhat struggle with that because you're so logical? So it depends on what we're talking about. So I, I will say I'm not big in davening. Um, like I, I have a hard time davening. Rambam did too. If you read, if you read more of Uchim, he's uh, he's got questions about davening. Um, but it's uh, but davening is um, yeah difficult because it's difficult to square kind of what davening is about with the idea of you know Hashem who is sur tamim palo right the idea that that he's unchanging. So the, this notion that you're davening and therefore God changes his mind or you say some tehillim and therefore God fixes things like. I'm not a huge believer in that. I tend to believe the the sort of, again, Rambam rationalistic side, which is that really what davening is about is re-inspiring yourself or reorienting yourself toward what God wants of you as opposed to trying to convince God to do what you want of him. Right? That, that, that I agree with, but that doesn't mean that I'm, you know, I, I particularly get a lot out of it. The, you know, the, the stuff that I tend to get a lot more out of uh, is either studying hashkafa uh, or immersing myself in sort of the, the again, halachic process. Um, but, you know, that, or, or, actually living, you know, the, the holidays with my kids, right? That, that sort of stuff is, is the stuff that I get something out of. Um, but yeah, I mean, listen, if you, if you live a religious lifestyle, there will, at some point, you, you will have to say, I'm, I believe this thing because it's been proved out to be true on a practical level through history, not necessarily because I know for 100% certainty that X, Y, or Z happened 4,000 years ago, um, because there's just no way to prove for or against. And so I'm, I think it's actually a weak take. Well, you'll see very often in the from community. Well, you know, I'm going to make this particular Kuzari argument about why this is the way that things came down, or I'm going to make this this argument about Das Torah and how what the Rabbanim what what the what the what the halachic authorities are saying in the Gemara here is reflective of, of practice two thousand years beforehand. You know, I I have a tough time with 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 a lot of that stuff, and and frankly, I think that the the I'm very comfortable with the notion that virtually any philosophic system that you embrace is going to have a leap of faith at the heart of it. And that's true of literally all philosophic systems. That's the great lie of, of I think, atheism is that atheists will claim that they don't have to make any sort of assumptions about the universe. And then they'll start using all sorts of verbs that don't make sense in the context of an atheistic universe, right? In, in a deterministic universe, active verbs don't make sense. And yet you'll hear people like Sam Harris using active verbs all the time, talking about motivating yourself, changing yourself, doing, all, well, you're in a deterministic universe. Why? Or they'll talk about morality. Nothing about evolution suggests that morality is a direct outgrowth in any ought to level. So, you know, that that's an assumption that you have to make. Now you can make the assumption, that's fine, but you have to acknowledge you're making the assumption. And I think the same thing is true in religious communities. And acknowledging that, I think is a lot easier than trying to argue your way into belief. I don't think very many people have ever believed in religion on the basis of, I was argued my way into the veracity of this miracle happened, or I was argued in my way into the veracity of, of you know, it, this is exactly how the Torah was said or something. Like, I, I just don't think that's how people behave or how people think. We'll be right back to this episode with the famous Ben Shapiro. But first, let me tell you about our sponsor, um, I was gonna like make a joke about the VPN company that Ben Shapiro always uh, advertises on his, or like one of the like mattresses. But it's not them. It's actually a company that's way cooler. Aaron's Casino Farms. Yes, that famous supermarket in Queens. About a year and a half ago, I actually um, my friend of mine, Shlomo Zions, came over to me and said, "Hey, do you know any Jewish-owned businesses that the world needs to see?" Um, because he has a friend, Iro Malone Mint, who has a massive YouTube channel and. They want to see what it's like in the Orthodox Jewish world and said, I got you covered. We went to Aaron's Casino Farms. Aside from being just a gorgeous, beautiful, big store, wide aisles, wide selection of amazing fruits, vegetables, uh, dairy, meat, you name it, they got it. I mean, if it's not kosher, they don't have it. But strictly kosher, they have it. But aside from that and just being a great experience, when you walk there, there's also that idea that 
it's well priced. It's it's something that we're all looking for these days when you go to a supermarket. Yeah, you want a nice experience. You want it to be clean, but you also want to walk out of there being able to afford other things. And it's a very affordable store. So if you're ever in Queens, go check them out. And they also have great customer service. Uh, I know the staff there, whenever I can't find something, they literally don't just point me to the direction of where I need to go. They take me there. And I'm like, okay, I didn't realize I was just like an aisle over from the carrots and there's a huge carrot sign there. I'm not the best shopper. But if you need anything from a supermarket and you're in Queens, go to Aaron's Casino Farms and there's a new Aaron's popping up soon in the Muncie area. Can't really tell you much more than that, but stay tuned and uh, check out the show notes for more information about Aaron's Casino Farms. The best, the best, the best, the best. And now back to my conversation with Ben Shapiro. So before I get to my like, last questions, more of the fun questions. I want to ask you, so there's this idea that Misa Avo Simulan Bunim, what happened to our forefathers um, is like a macro level kind of what happens to us. And I've definitely heard a lot of lectures and share them about how it really applies in world history. And it's it's kind of this idea that the history repeats itself. So do you, you know, obviously, I think we're part of the generation that was, you know, living the good, you know, orthodox life, not our grandparents, you know, that went through the Holocaust. But do you, are you scared of, you know, we see a rise in anti-Semitism. Do you, you know, foresee something, I don't know, bad happening or maybe a bigger urge for us to go to Israel and just get out of here? Well, listen, I think Israel is the great protection against world anti-Semitism because now there's an actual state that exists for people to run to. I mean, obviously when it came to the Holocaust, there was no place for anybody to go in Europe. Uh, basically, all the countries closed their doors to anybody who was seeking to escape, including the British Mandate. So, you know, the fact that Israel exists is a major, uh, it, it is the major force in the world against anti-Semitism. You know, I, you always have to be wary of human nature, which seems replete with anti-Semitism, unfortunately. The, the good in human nature has to be carefully cultivated. The bad in human nature tends to come out pretty naturally. And at a time when we spend less time than ever cultivating our characters, it seems like uh, the, the reversion to dark forces uh, is not something that is that is too far away. Uh, so, you know, th- that's true throughout human history. I, I do think that that because human nature doesn't change, we tend to do the same mistakes over and over and over. Uh, now, the good news is that history has progressed to the point where, you know, for, for purposes of Jewish protection, a state exists literally dedicated to that proposition. That's a very good thing. That doesn't mean that, that America won't continue to be an extraordinary safe haven for Jews across the planet as it has been historically. Uh, it does mean that Israel provides an extraordinary bulwark and, and at, at, at its core, like its literal core mission is to provide that bulwark. And so that's a, that's a change from, from human history over the last couple thousand of years. Is that a goal for you personally? Like, would you foresee yourself living in Israel with your kids and, and family? I mean, I, I don't foresee moving to Israel. Uh, I mean, America is the country I was born in. America is an incredible country. The Constitution of the United States is an unparalleled document of governance. That doesn't mean that that I don't see the extraordinary value of Israel and the extraordinary spiritual value of Israel or that I don't plan on spending an enormous amount of time with my kids in Israel. Okay, that's a nice answer. That's a fair answer. So what's your favorite mitzvah? There's 639, uh, 613 commandments. Which one ha- holds like a special place in your heart? Hmm. I mean, the, it's the, not the, davening. I got that. Yeah, no, not, not the davening so much. Um, so, uh, hmm. I, I love a lot of them. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm struggling. It, it could be. I, yeah, I could shift the question to like today. Like, what? What's something recently? It doesn't. Don't worry. This isn't like the answer. Yeah, like, yeah. What today? Did you? Okay. What? What? To, what today? Did? did what? To, yeah. Yeah. What today is your favorite mitzvah? Right now, what your, the way you connect to God. I mean, the, the the way that I connect to God is is through learning, and so for me, you know, that 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 commandment, which I take as as sort of reading and educating myself, uh, is is the way that that I enjoy Torah the most. Uh, in terms of you know, the, the the reason I'm struggling is because some things that are commanded in the Torah are not explicit mitzvot in the sense that they're not uh, sort of concretized. Uh, so, for example, my my favorite pasuk in the Torah is from Devarim, where it talks about choosing life because so you and your children may live. That's that's a that is a mitzvah technically. I mean, you're supposed to choose life, but how you manifest that is not actually like you know put on tefillin this morning. Uh, so it, that's so it depends on if you're talking mitzvah in like a practical sense, or if you're talking mitzvah in like as in a commandment from God, because there are a bunch of those in the Torah that are beautifully stated. Right? The commandment to be holy because God made you holy, or the commandment. Uh, to um, or the commandment to treat the stranger well. Like, there are a bunch of commandments that that actually end up being you know, materialized in a wide variety. Shabbos, 
right? Is is uh, Shabbos is always the big one. Everyone loves Shabbos. What, what what's not to like about everyone Shabbos? loves Shabbos? Yeah, exactly. That's that's the easiest pitch for Judaism. Shabbos is always the best pitch for it, Judaism. <laughs> do you find that the, like all the non-Jews you're talking to, like they see like wait, what do you mean I can't text you? I mean I can text you, but I'm not getting an answer. Yeah. Do you see them being like? what is this magic? And you're like, it's not the craziest idea of just shutting off for a day. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the, the, the truth is that, you know, look, the, the Christians have Shabbos too. They just don't observe it the same way. I mean, and, and in traditional communities, they tend to observe it a little bit more the same way. Like things are supposed to shut down. You're supposed to spend the day with community. If you go back 70, 80 years in the United States, blue laws basically prevented you from like, you couldn't go to movies. You actually had to spend time. It was, it, it, it resembled Jewish Sabbath a lot more. It was just on Sundays. It's the easiest draw for, especially as overwhelmed as people are with electronic devices now. Every oh person gosh. I speak to who doesn't keep Shabbos, whether Jewish or not Jewish, that, that's an easy draw. The idea of like, now I'm co- not just I'm going to, but I'm commanded to turn this stuff off and spend time with my family. That's kind of an amazing thing. I love that I can't use my phone. And I also love that I can't winnow, you know, because it's a big draw for me. Um, if Is there one person in history that you could spend an hour with that's no longer with us? It could be someone who recently passed away or it could be someone you've never met before. Who would you want to spend that hour with? Oh, um, well... On a Judaic level, I'd want to talk with Rambam because, again, I tend to be more rationalist in my approach to, to Judaism. And I'd be curious to see uh, his thoughts on the subsequent developments in Jewish history. Um, but uh, you know, on a, on a not Jewish level, I, I'd love to talk with, with Churchill just because he's a really, really interesting person with interesting thoughts, terrific writer. Um, and uh, listen, I've been privileged that People who are living, if I want to talk to somebody, thank God, I can I can basically call them up on the phone, and so I get to talk with interesting. Yeah, people you, on a you your team was reaching out to me for months, and and you know what? I finally, finally made, some made time the magic and, happen. It's a, yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah, this is a single <laughs> moment. Sure, really anytime, is. anytime, anytime. Um, so, you know, you're you're a lot of people in the non-religious world, a lot of people who aren't Jewish, mostly people who aren't Jewish, and a lot of religious people are are watching and listening, but definitely my audience are are people who are religious. What advice would you give for the religious world? Obviously, you know, you you give over ideas in your show that's based on, um, you know, the Torah, but right now we're talking to, I'm sure non-Jewish people watch this also, hey everyone, but um, to the from world, what would you want to tell them if you could speak directly to them? I mean, the thing that I would say is it's a, it's a real Shonda that the only person in American public life who speaks broadly to, to a large audience on these topics and wears a kippah is me. And there are people who are much more knowledgeable than I am uh, and and who are have completely neglected their duty to speak to, to pressing social issues of our time. And, you know, maybe some of that is just inability to get on TV and that's fine, but, but there are a lot of people who aren't trying and sort of the, the mentality of, of the Orthodox, which has tended to be like, let's take a back seat. Let's, let's kind of, you know, go quietly our own way. That's not working. It just isn't. Uh, the, the fact is that if, if God is going to command you to be a light unto the nations at a certain level, you're actually going to have to do something. So Rabbi Blech actually wrote a beautiful piece the last week uh, about the Roe versus Wade decision that's about to come down from the Supreme Court. He says, listen, the, the Jews blew it. Like the Catholics are doing our work on this sort of stuff. And he is correct on that. I mean, he is, he is right on that. And so you know, my, my message to, to the Orthodox, just like it is to religious people of all stripes, is get out there and say what you believe the world ought to be. Because frankly, that is part of our core mission. I, part, listen, part of our core mission is, is making sure your family is taken care of and making sure that your family is preserved and that your values are preserved through your family. That's super important. It's the most important thing. But part of your mission is also to spread that value you know, outward. And if you're not doing that, and if you're leaving that up to people of other religions to do it, I think that's an, a fundamental abrogation of duty. Okay, that is beautiful. That's nice. And you're giving me chizek to really get out there and speak what I believe in. So thank you. What's the worst advice that Ben Shapiro has ever received? Ah, uh, the worst advice. Um, hmm. I'm trying to think. I've gotten a lot of good advice. The 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 worst advice. I mean, there are certain things people have said over and over and over, and I just didn't do them, and it worked out. So, like, slow down. That that, that one I get a lot. Uh, and uh, slow 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 down never worked for me, and so it just kind of got ignored. Um, and the 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 worst advice is when when people say on an impractical level, follow your dreams. That that <laughs> is that that is an impractical thing. I don't mean that you shouldn't follow your dreams. I mean, that you should have a practical plan to achieve that. And you should also have a practical assessment of your own skill side. So what, what people tend to do is uh, follow my dream. I wish to be a famous rock star and you can't sing and you're tone deaf. Like you, you might want to think about having a better dream. Like your, right. your dream is not good. Uh, so uh, th- that that's, uh, I think being practical is, is definitely a big one. You know, not relying on luck, actually trying to, to plan for, for the future is really, really important. Um, you know, also... The, the, the notion that, that you are supposed to rely heavily on other people 
uh, to, to do your work for you, I think is, is a mistake. The world is going to be a kind place to you. That, that, I just don't think that's true. Now, I, I never received a lot of that kind of advice. I've received a lot. Again, I think that if you talk to people who have done well at what they do, it's because mostly they've received good advice. Um, but the, you know, the, the other piece of advice that, that I've received is, is somehow some kind of on the other side, which was, uh, you know, you're, you're, what you're saying, right. You know, you're, you're dreaming too big. You're, you're, you're looking too far down the road. No, you should be very practical here and you should be a dreamer here. Meaning like, think about where you want to be in 20 years. And that's like out here and that's nice. And then at the two year level, you want to see like something practical that you can achieve. It's sort of like when you're a beginning bowler, you know, you should know that you want to hit the pins down here, but really what you're trying to do is hit the arrows that are right in front of you on the lane. Uh, and I think that very often we tend to mix those two things up. So you hear from people who say, don't even bother about the, the pins. Don't even look at the pins. Just look at the arrows. That's not going to work. And then you'll have people who say, only look at the pins, never look at the arrows. Don't worry about that. It'll be fine. And that's not going to work either. Well, Ben Shapiro, I don't know why, but Barack Obama follows me on Twitter Maybe I, we've definitely wow. interacted a little on Twitter. Maybe one day you'll follow. I don't know why. I'm not even into politics at all. I just maybe even a meme once with Biden. I don't know. Maybe one day you'll follow me. I definitely follow you. Thank you so much for the, the work that you're doing for the world and the work, frankly, you're doing for Claudia Soul. It's, it's really beautiful. And um, I really appreciate your time. And hey, thank you so much. I appreciate it. I don't know if you could tell, but I was I was so nervous talking to him. It was, you know, I was very nervous about just the fact that we were digitally doing this. Um, and he has an incredible team. They were so accommodating and Ben was so accommodating. Um, and, and yeah, it was, it was, it was very nerve wracking. I, I had a million more questions I wanted to ask, but I also felt like that was a lot of time that I was given with Ben and he's a busy guy. He really has a lot to do and it was great. It was great. And, and I really love that idea that he said at the end that, you know, Orthodox Jews, we, we have this responsibility of trying to be a light onto the nations. And and very often in today's day and age, you, you don't find enough people speaking up. I mean, you do have a lot of, you know, rightfully so people speaking up, but there's so many, I guess, Orthodox Jews out there that we could be saying more, we could be doing more. For me personally, that was that was a, a very big uh, inspiration. And, and I think the fact that you know, I, I was, I am, and still always blown away by the fact that that Ben wears his yarmulke. He, he, I, I've heard him in the past interviews. He's like, yeah, it's a given. I, I don't know if it's such a given. I, I know so many people, not in such a public light, that they're not wearing their yarmulke by work, and and it, I understand that it kind of makes sense. And you ask your rub, and it, there's different situations. But for him, I, I love the idea that he's just like, it's not even an option. I'm to not wear my yarmulke. I'm gonna wear my yarmulke, and um. Yeah, I think I think he's doing great work, and um, I think this is just the beginning of him. Um, I think there's a lot more of him to see, and and you know what? Round two, that was just part one. We got to do a part two in person, Merit Hashem. And if you haven't subscribed yet, please subscribe to the Living L'Chaim YouTube channel. And if you want to hear these interviews, Inspiration for the Nation, or any other podcast, a few days before, you could go on Apple, you could go on Spotify, you'll get early access there. So just type in Inspiration for the Nation with Yaakov Langer, and you'll get first access three, four days before. Everyone always asks, why does one come out? It's a lot easier to edit the audio. The video is a little more complicated. But you know what? Subscribe to us on YouTube. Subscribe to us on audio. If you have any feedback, any suggestions, then please go to Living Lachaim.com and please in the YouTube notes um, leave a comment on who you want me to interview and also on the next conversation with Ben let me know which questions you want me to ask him I love feedback and I read every single comment so please tag away type away ask away and keep on being an inspiration till next time Lachaim Living Lachaim